Hello, welcome to the Run Testers. I'm Nick. I'm Kieran. And in this video, we are going to be reviewing the Coros Vertex 2. So what's new with the Coros Vertex 2? Well, Coros has added new features to make the Vertex 2 a competitor at the high end of the market up against the best of the Phoenix 6 range. Headline upgrades here include 32 gigabytes of music storage and offline playback, so you can drag and drop MP3s from your laptop pair Bluetooth headphones and run with music phone free. There's also offline maps with topographical street view and hybrid options, plus all systems dual frequency GPS. Now this aims to improve the accuracy of your tracking and real time pace particularly in those trickier built up areas and spots where GPS can struggle. You're also getting a huge battery life with 140 hours full GPS tracking, extendable to 240 in the lowest power Ultramax mode. There's 50 hours in the most precise dual frequency mode, 90 hours in all systems mode, 30 hours using all satellites plus music, and you'll get 60 days general usage. Other neat additions include elevation profiles when you're out on a run, and those will show you how much elevation you have left to climb. You can load routes onto the watch, but unfortunately there's no turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Now this is a chunky watch and at 89 grams, it's heavier than the Vertex 1. It's also heavier than all but the biggest Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro, which comes in at 93 grams. The Vertex 2's 1.4 inch 280 by 280 display is the biggest screen you'll find on a Coros, and that's bigger than the original Vertex 1. It can handle up to eight customizable stats at a time. Durability wise, it's water resistant to 100 meters. It has a diamond-like carbon sapphire display and a coated titanium alloy bezel. And there are interchangeable silicon or nylon 26 mil straps. There are a few new physiological tracking smarts here too. If you're interested in monitoring heart rate variability, it offers ECG based HRV reads just by holding the bezel, though these aren't medically approved yet. It also has an optical pulse oximeter, so it'll monitor blood oxygen at high altitudes. The Vertex 2 supports Bluetooth 5.0 dual mode and Wi Fi, so it'll play nice with a wide selection of chest straps, accessories, and third party devices, including broadcasting heart rate, but there's no AMP Plus. Features wise, you're getting the full suite of training tools and insights from Coros Evo Lab. We've done a big video on that here on the channel, so check it out. So things like training load, fatigue, base fitness, running performance and recovery time recommendations are included. You can also create and load up training plans and there's activity sleep, resting heart rate tracking, along with things like sunrise and sunset time and temperature readout. The Vertex 2 comes in at £599 in the UK and £699 in the US, so that's a chunk more expensive than the first generation Vertex, and it puts it in the ballpark with the Garmin Phoenix 6 Pro and the 6X Pro. On to the run test. Uh, there's loads of really exciting new features on this watch. That's fair to say we're going to talk a little bit about those features and our general kind of life experience of using it rather than diving into everything in tiny detail, but you can look at that in other videos probably. Let's start with one of the big headline new features, which is the maps on the watch. How have you found using the maps? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally tend to prefer something like turn-by-turn -turn navigation. So the omission of that <laughs> on this watch is a big one for me. I like to load up a course, be able to follow it rather than sort of diving into looking at all the context that you get from a sort of underlaid or you know yeah. topo maps but i know you're, you're slightly different Nick. well i like maps and i love and I, I do use the maps quite a lot on like phoenix and i generally like a map. i do think the context is really important i just find in the forest for me there's often a lot of trails and you can choose the wrong one but actually not having turn by turn on this i think is probably more annoying than not having the map this is basically a breadcrumb trail laid over a map and the things I found, it, the fact that it has no street names is big. Like, uh, it's quite easy to pick the wrong street if you're getting not having turn by turn. And if you are just cruising through the forest, I don't want to get the, I don't want the only alert on my watch to be you've gone off course. Yeah. Getting the notification before you turn is very useful. So, something we'd hope to come in the future. It's nice to have maps on the watch, but at the moment, I don't think it's a lot better than breadcrumb trails, uh, especially without turn by turn. And I did find certain conditions of the screen is a little bit washed out on this watch. And with maps, okay. um, it's very hard sometimes to see streets in particular. Yep. Um, it was just made again harder without turn by turn. Um, so that's some. So basically, that undermines that kind of detail that you're hoping to get from the maps if you can't quite see it or you're not. Mm -hmm. And if you have to kind of stop and and, yeah. and get close up and stuff, that's that's where I sort of find. Well, actually, I just want something to be able to nudge me before a turn's coming up, and then I'm. I'm not interrupting my run, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it works like that. If there's like a, a pond or a really dark bit of green on this map, it, it becomes very clear what it is. And certain you know, major roads are marked with like a different color. And that actually just shows the limitations of the map elsewhere. Because when that is there, you don't get that context. They're really good. 
But when you are, when it, you know, if I'm tracking a run, if I'm following a trail on the Phoenix on the other side, it's very, very easy to see, or, or the Phoenix or the Forerunner, how much better it is on there. It's just much sharper, easier to see where you're going. The street names help a lot if you're running on urban environments, obviously. So yeah, in general, it's a nice thing to have, but I think there needs to be some improvements made there. I'd like to see a lot more contrast for one. The elevation map you get, I do like a lot, yeah. just a little thing of the run. Um, so you get to see that ahead of time, right? So you can yeah. load up a route and then you get to see what you're about to go and do, right? Yeah, and that's just great. You see ahead of time, you can see along the way how much you've got left on the climb. I had one moment there was a lot of lag and actually I was at the top of the climb, but it said I was halfway up, but it quickly, eventually, well, it rectified that and it was fine. Um, I think that's a nice touch. It's, it's not as advanced as what you get in Climb Pro. Yeah, Climb, <laughs> so climb Pro is a, is a really, really good tool. Very I think clever. that's, yeah, and this isn't quite up to scratch with that. But. Yeah, it's not breaking you down climb by climb and stuff like that, but... Broadly speaking, it, it was quite nice. I don't think I found quite, I don't think I got annoyed by this. If you're on the map screen and you hit pause on the watch, which is the center button, it doesn't pause. It it opens up the zooming function on the wheel. So a lot of time I'd go pause and run and then I'd start around, I hadn't paused that. And it's a bit annoying. So that's just something you have to keep in mind a lot. It's the same on the elevation profile. Actually, if you press pause there, it doesn't, it zooms in on a bit. Something you'd like to be, little quality of life improvements, basically. The other thing I guess we should talk about is just loading routes on, yeah. which was a little bit more fiddly yeah. than on this. You Basically, I had to either download a route that I'd run previously on Strava or someone else I was going to follow, and I'd have to airdrop it to my phone and open it in the app. Yeah. It's different in the other watches. Yeah, right? like in Garmin, you can create the route in the app, um, which is very handy, just to send it straight to the watch there. Or with um, Polar and Garmin, you can use Kamut can't you, to create the routes and other things like that. So. That, again, that is not a big problem, but it's, again, it's just small little quality of life improvements. I think sometimes they add up a little bit. So there was one thing on the, on the maps. Did you tend to use the topo? or the? Because there's three levels, isn't there? There's like the three layers. You've got the topo, the hybrid, and then... The street view. The street view. I use the hybrids. Okay. And I think the street view, I think, is the most useful one a lot of the time because it actually shows the past. With the topo map, you know, it's great to get some of that detail, but I think you need a lot of the street view as well for me to get the context I'm after. One other problem I did have, actually, on it was... At first, in particular, because you can set it to the heading to be the heading up on the watch when you yeah. look at it, which is what you want because you want to know you're on the right path. Um, but when you're running like that, the compass is deciding that heading and it's all over the place. And you turn that and it, at first it took like beep, 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 then heading's in the right place. And that's just too long to be holding your watch hand. They've improved that of an update already. I expect it to get even better, but it's still a little bit... You just net again. It's something the Garmin's been doing for a long time. They've ironed out that thing. Every time you do that, you're on the right heading. It's pointing the right way up, and it's very clear where you are. Because I think if you're if the heading's pointing the wrong way, it suddenly becomes much harder to work out which path is the right one to take. Because you've got to do the mental maths in your head. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, all in all, maps. There's, there's some improvements to make. I'm pretty confident to make them. It's a nice addition to have. But right now, it's not a not a reason I'd, I'd buy this watch yet. Me neither. But then I don't really use them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Another really flagship feature, I was incredibly excited about this, is the dual frequency GPS mode. It was meant to get you really precise accuracy. He, he went crazy for this. He oh. could not wait for this. Lo oh. Loop runner here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, need a lot of, I do a lot of hard workouts just out in the wild, and I need accurate pacing. I use lap pace. I don't even use instant pace, because lap pace is more accurate, and I just need to know if I'm running this lap, you know, say I've got an 800 meter rep to do, or a K rep to do, I want to know I'm doing the rough average pace correctly. Thought this was going to be a big help because actually the Garmin Phoenix is pretty flaky on this. I've used it for a long time. It's, it's usable, but I know there are certain places it's not very good on GPS. So just to, just to explain quickly what what we're getting here. So we're getting all it's all satellite systems, right? Yeah. And then on top of that, it's like a dual frequency thing. It basically used to just be available in commercial airliners, I think. Uh, they're starting to drop. I think a Huawei watch randomly has it, and then this watch. The idea is you're going to get centimeter level accuracy on your GPS switch to pacing. Now. I've done a lot of testing of this, Kieran. I've you done have. a lot of obsessing over maps, and there have been some great moments with it, but overall, this has definitely left me wanting. And I think a lot of the time, it gives you the best of what GPS can offer, but it still has the same problems you get with all GPS. It will cut through buildings, it will go wrong under tree cover, it will cut off things, and you know it might be slightly better on average, but it actually in real-time pacing, I didn't find a difference. And you're paying a price for this, not only literally with your cash, but actually you're paying a battery life price. So the big battery yeah. life that comes with this watch cuts down, I think, 45 hours. to 45 hours with the the mode on, you yeah. know, the, the, the dual satellite mode, or sorry, the dual frequency mode on. So you are, there is a trade-off here. Is that trade-off worth it? It just hasn't proved it for me. I like, and I think actually it goes beyond just not being that much better than other watches. There's been a problem with this watch. Chorus has a lot of smoothing behind the scenes in the runs. And generally this works. Like if you get the algorithms right, Smoothing out little kinks in GPS provides a very nice track. It helps with pacing. It stops it jumping around the GPS. I think it's been over that. Basically, I run a lot of loops from doing workouts. So I'm doing a road workout. I'll go to a loop. I know it's quiet. I can consistently pace it. And there's one near me where the vertex 
I was just running like 20 seconds a mile slower than I thought. I thought, okay, this watch is meant to be the most accurate. I'm just having a bad day. Kept going, started to really look at the GPS tracks and really work out where I was running on the road. And I could see it was just cutting off every single corner on the loop, smoothing it out. I put it up against the Enduro on a lot of runs. And actually, when you dive into those maps as well, you could see this wasn't in that mode. I expected it not to be sending me through buildings, sending me yeah. running in rivers. All of those things still seem to be present. So yeah. I was surprised, you know, exactly. it wasn't, it definitely wasn't matching the tracks that I know that I was running. So yeah, and when you, Overall, if you know, in most of these runs, it's not really a problem. The overall distance is usually about right, but on yeah. those reps, I could see if I'm doing a lot of one loop, I'm um, every single rep is coming up short. My pacing's all over the place. I tested like seven other watches on the loop to see what I could get. Actually, most accurate in the end was the Apple Watch with my um, iPhone and the Forerunner 245. Always been a very accurate watch, the 245. Uh, and, I, and I can't, as a result, I couldn't, not only is it, was this watch I wouldn't buy for accurate GPS, the use I use it for, which is a lot of that kind of running, it would be worse than many other watches. Yeah. So, so basically, if you're, if, if you're trying to solve the problem of getting real-time pacing spot on so that you can be hitting your reps right, yeah. this doesn't solve that problem. You're going to pay a little bit of an extra price in terms of the loss of battery life. And that's another one of the key selling points of this watch that doesn't quite Not yet. live uh, up. Yeah. I think a lot of the problem is Chorus can refine this smoothing, and I think they will, and I'm hoping it's going to get a lot better. I did have, I did, actually, I did do one big city race with this, running through Canary Wharf, and I could see very clearly it gave me a better track than the Garmin Peach on the hand. Again, didn't, it still went wrong on the real-time pacing in that rep, so it didn't really help me, but the track was better afterwards, which is nice, I guess. So I think it's not really, provide, again, not providing that quality of life improvement I was hoping for. Again, like with the maps, I hope in the future to see some updates, to see you refine that bit, but at the moment, Coral needs to chill out on the smoothing a little bit for me. And then one final thing, if you're running, if you all you want this to do is just track your overall distance, in my test, it came up within an, an acceptable kind of margin for error against the watches I tested it against. So that, you know, if you're not bothered about that real-time pacing thing, then maybe this isn't such a problem. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I also, in general runs, not on loops, it had some great moments was getting me exactly the right side of the road, all that kind of stuff. It was quite nice a lot of the time. But I just think if you do a lot of corners, there's that algorithm under, underneath that potentially is scrambling what actually probably be more accurate if they left the watch to it almost. Yeah. Other thing I really want to see on this in the future is you can't just have a map screen on the run. It's only if you set up a route that you see the map at all, like on like Garmin's and all those watches, I will have just a map screen. Because I just like to, you know, sometimes I just want to see the trail and follow it back myself. I don't need to set up a route. Um, so I'm hoping that's going to be a feature that comes to watch. I expect it will be. Another massive selling point of this and all Chorus watches is the battery life. We're listed here at 140 hours of GPS only, 90 hours of all systems on, that's every satellite system at once, and then 45 hours of the dual GPS mode. And Chorus watches basically, when you're not running, they will not lose any battery. That's kind yeah. of their thing. Yeah. So uh, I'll just quickly, Kieran's has a great testing. I'd say it lasted me like 19 days using the highest, um, the highest accuracy GPS mode running 100K weeks. Really impressed. Uh, Kieran, you've done some like, big tests on this. I have. So, you know, overall, kind of my battery life, it took me around two weeks to drain to 50%. Okay. But within that, there was quite a lot of running. Yeah. So one of the tests I did was a four-hour run in the max GPS mode, and that burned only 7%, which is really, really good. Yeah. Uh, for comparison, like the same run on the Garmin Enduro, uh, that had 18% uh, burn rate. So, yeah. you know, that's considerably better. Yeah. Um, and something that kind of really stands out. I think overall, I, I was seeing overnight, you'd get like a, a like a 1% burn rate, yeah. essentially, if you're not doing anything that's just general usage. Yeah. Uh, an hour run, again, 1% to 2% tops yeah. in terms of overall GPS usage, and that's being like in the standard mode. So you're going to get, I think in the same, in line with the, with the Enduro, you're going to get a month's usage out of this training daily, an hour, and then doing a big long run on a Sunday. That big long run might be kind of anywhere between sort of four and six hours. Yeah. It's definitely going to last you easily multi-day ultras. Yeah. No problem at all. MDS, those kind of things. It's going to eat that up. Those no big expeditions in the mountains. Anything that, yeah. Like, I actually say, actually, mine lasted 19 days, and that was including one slightly buggy, oh, we had an early version of the watch, dropped by like 10% overnight one night, and yeah. you know, it still lasted 19 days. Yeah, I think it's going to even outlast in Enduro if you're putting it, I would definitely say for me, I'm going to put it in the lower accuracy GPS mode, the 90 hours yeah. one, and I think it will last, you know, five weeks probably, potentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's outstanding. Um, and there's some trade-offs there, but, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous battery. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's another one of those watches. Is it? There aren't many of them out there, but it's another one that now jumps into the category of there is no battery anxiety. Yeah. You can look at this on sort of 20, less than 20% and think, I've got a five-hour run to do, and it's still it's still yeah. going to be there, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it was, yeah. it's a crazy feeling. And there's a, it's a, I sort of said it about the Enduro, and I'll say it about the, the Vertix 2. That is a luxury... Yeah. of that sort of not having to worry about charging it, that you don't realise 
you love so much until you actually experience it. And now I've now I've had it with these two watches. It's going to be very hard to go back, I yeah. think, personally. But yeah, I mean, I often use the Apple Watch, which is the complete opposite end of the spectrum. But it is nice not thinking about it, especially if you're somebody who travels a lot. Another big feature added to this watch, which again kind of brings its line with what you're getting on the Phoenix and a few other Garmin's, is music. But you're getting a different kind of music experience here, so. so. Yeah, and it's not a great one. <laughs> I mean, it's so basically all you can do, it's like going back to, I think, the 90s, I'd say 90s, maybe early 2000s, where you're basically dragging and dropping MP3s. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can only essentially add one single list of those MP3s to your favorite music. Yeah. You can't do any kind of ordering. So you're like creating one playlist on the watch that you can then control. There are, there are no controls for other things on your phone, so you yeah. can't control Spotify. So there's no offline Spotify on here, but you also can't control Spotify from a paired phone. Um, and it just makes the overall music experience, I don't know, it's just not one that I would ever do. I haven't, I'm, I've gone way beyond that time when I want to be picking 20 tracks and dropping it onto a watch and leaving it there. Yeah. Flip side to that, I guess, Nick, you sort of mentioned sometimes you listen to a lot of podcasts and maybe that's, yeah. a, that's a thing that people might use it for, but. Yeah, it's easier to get podcast files and music files, obviously, so you just gotta find the free source. Again, it, it is the, it's the hassle of doing that every day. Like, I might do it for a race, a one-off experience. I might get a few podcasts on for that one-off. I open there is it, uh, first time I used it for a podcast, it crashed, because um, I had the music and the maps going at the same time, it couldn't handle it. Um, it's been updates since that seems to not be happening anymore, but um, there's no, it's, but with a podcast, there's no like, like fast forward thing. So it crashes, you're going back to start the podcast and you're, you're listening from the start again, which is not fun. Um, so yeah, it's like, again, it's a little bit lacking. The streaming service is so much easier. If you can do wireless transfer or if you can link to an account and get your music on, unless you do have a lot of music files still knocking around, then that, you know, it's great. And you don't mind the kind, you quite enjoy the kind of admin of it. I know some people do, fair enough. But um, at the moment it's, Again, it's another feature which is on the watch now, and you, there's room for improvement, and I expect them to make those improvements, but again, it's it's only a selling point if you do have that quite niche lifestyle with music. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, listen, this is a watch that is built for people to be doing long adventures as well, so yeah. it's got that kind of ultra uh, sort of aspect to it, and on those ones, you're, you're going to be carrying your phone. Yeah. So it's kind of like, actually, it needs to be able to work with the phone in some ways. Oh, you yeah. know, I, I think that's something that's kind of clearly missing here. You know, offline music, great if you can get it but actually i think in a lot of use cases people will have their phone and for it not to do that is a bit of an issue for me but mm. i think a good thing to talk about is just how your general use how do you find just using the watch generally it's also quite a big watch things like that how do you find like life with it basically? okay so i've been living for a long time with a garmin enduro which is kind of because of the huge battery life it's just become a go-to for me yeah. i really like this watch it's always on my wrist yeah nylon strap is comfortable when I first put the Coros Vertex 2 on, I found it way more uncomfortable. It's a big hulking great thing of a watch. You know, it weighs more. It sits higher off the wrist. Yeah. The the silicone straps, which are much wider, I think are, are a lot less comfortable. So in terms of overall comfort, this isn't a watch that I would be, I sort of found myself happy wearing 24 seven. So in terms of doing all that other stuff outside, sleep tracking, activity tracking, all that kind of stuff, I felt it falls down because I just want to take it off pretty much as soon as I finish my run. Yeah. That's me personally. Some people might like that bigger kind of build. I didn't find that with the Enduro, yeah. even though it is still quite a big watch. Yeah. And you know, one thing I would recommend definitely, you can get nylon straps with this. Yeah. Buy that. If you're going to buy this watch, get a nylon strap. It's much more comfortable. Yeah. Um, but overall, kind of day-to-day -day use, I think you know we talked about the screen brightness. Yeah. I think there's an issue there. It feels to me in most lights, it's a little bit dull. And I'm going to say that indoors and outdoors, yeah. you know, for example, when we're trying to sort of shoot this screen to put it on the video, you find yourself having to put the light on all the time yeah. to make it bright enough to actually see on the camera. And that is the same, I think, with your eyes. But so there's a few things here that initially for me are, are mm. problems actually with the watch. Yeah, I think obviously that screen brightness thing is definitely so you can't adjust it on the watch. They're clearly, it's one of the reasons that's such a great battery life. But yeah, it's not so nice. It's not so, such a nice watch to interact with constantly. Right? Exactly. So it's going to be your daily watch. You want to be looking at it. You want to be playing with it. We were both not huge fans of the watch faces available. I think yeah. like it's quite a one, the one style of watch is very busy and like a bit, ah, and I, yeah, I'd prefer just quite a simple watch face and that, I'm sure those will come. That's not going to be a problem for the long term. I also like, I've always liked thin watch. I didn't really actually love wearing the Enduro that much, even though the Enduro was pretty comfy. I never really sleep in those kind of watches. I couldn't really sleep with this watch. I haven't minded wearing it all the time, but at night I take it off. That tends to be, you know, much more kind of things like the Apple Watch or 245, Chorus Pace 2. Those little watches really appeal to me. Um, but obviously they don't last they don't last three weeks in a charge but still um, yeah so I think there's definitely 
Yeah, I wouldn't mind a bit more screen bright. I'd happily turn the brightness up and take yeah. a week less battery. It's already lasting four weeks, five weeks. Yeah, give me, <laughs> give me the option. Give me the choice. I think just having the choice would be a nice thing. You know, yeah. sometimes maybe you... You might you'd be able to have it dull. Sometimes you you brighten yeah. it up when you really want to, but you know. Yeah, it certainly would help with the maps as well to be able to spark it up a bit. Let's dive into the Evo Lab kind of training and performance now analytics you get with the Coros Watch here. We've also got a big video on the channel which we dive into what you're really getting here. But in terms of my life experience of it, I broadly quite like Evo Lab. I do not like the running performance thing, which gives you a rating of like your percentage of your running level. And I never look at it, it doesn't really make any sense to me. I mean, say this morning I ran at 5 a.m. and it gave me a low one, that was right. But generally, you're not getting it every run. I don't use it. I think the training load. You don't get it every run because only certain runs qualify, yeah, right? Exactly. Which is. This is one of the big bugbears I've got with it. And actually, I've even sort of already seen people commenting about it. That it's not clear necessarily easily which runs no. do. You have to hit a certain heart percentage heart rate yeah. and you have to be running flat. And because and then it has to be in run mode. It can't be in trail mode or I believe in ultra mode maybe. But no, it no. has to be in a certain run mode as well. It can be track mode or run mode, I think. And then immediately that gets kind of confusing because you're getting it sometimes. You're not getting it other times. It's inconsistent. And if I'm not getting it after every run, I just don't get it. Yeah, I, even if you were, I just don't think it's that useful stat compared. The actual training load you're getting here, I think is quite good. Like the load, fatigue, and your tolerance roughly comes in line with what I think it is. It goes up nicely. It gives you a nice broad range of what load you should be in. I think that actually is quite well. It's quite nice to play on the watch. The race predictions on this are much more accurate than Garmin for me, like considerably. And then the recovery for this is more accurate than Garmin, but it's wrong in a different way. So Garmin tends to give me like five days recovery after an yeah. easy run. This will go, I did like a 24 mile, uh, not fast, but pretty hard. And then next day I uh, woke up and went, yeah, you're ready for hard training. I'm like, well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had a similar experience after I did like a 62K ultra, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't long before it's sort of, yeah, it's recommending that Gosh. I can go back out again, you know, again. <laughs> Maybe my cardio system is, but my legs certainly weren't. Yeah, so. I think it's probably a bit ambitious. Like, okay, I think it's closer to the truth than I'm getting from a guy which really thinks I'm not very fit at all, um, despite using it for many it's years. It's an optimist, Nick, is what it is. It's a very <laughs> yeah. optimistic coach. It's very encouraging yeah, it's until it runs you under the ground. <laughs> but yeah, so I do quite like the recovery. I don't mind the recovery. I think it's okay. I think the training load thing is quite well done on the watch. I don't really like the running performance thing. So overall, the Evo Labs... It's a, I find it as useful as any other one of these, and I don't use them very much. Marathon level, you know, it'll give you a marathon level as well, so it'll give you a percentage of where you're at in terms yeah. of, which again, I think it's a nice idea where you just can, for people who are sort of training for marathons, you get this sort of benchmarking mm. sort of effect. But again, I'm not sure how useful I found it. My main problem overall with Evo Lab yeah. is just the sheer breadth of stats in there, and some yeah. of them, without a sports science degree, feel quite kind of close and conflicting potentially yeah, so if you don't know this stuff very well mm. you know the difference between kind of load recovery fatigue and then there was uh run performance run performance so some of these just come very close together and when you're trying to sort of yeah mesh up that kind of matrix of information to go what am i supposed to be doing today yeah i don't think it's entirely clear all the time they'll if you don't like that kind of thing and that baffles you on some simpler watches this is going to confuse you. I'd also definitely say it's really tailored for a certain kind of runner, which is basically me, which is a road runner running lots of flat bars ahead of a marathon. Outside of that, the advice starts to become less and less useful. You might not even be able to set Evo Lab up at first because you have to do a certain amount on flat roads. So yeah, I, in my view, if they got rid of the running performance thing entirely, it would start to make it actually add clarity. Um, but yeah, the other thing it's not really at all into is like suggestive things. So yeah. there is a bit about HRV we'll come on to, but you know, the suggested workouts on Garmin's and Polar's yeah. now, which uses that training information just... I don't mind not being suggested workouts, but I think it might indicate a slight lack of intelligence in the system potentially. And there is one other feature that I really did like though, and this is something I don't think, off the top of my head, I don't think you get it on the Garmin's or the Polar's, is in real time you can see your load yeah. building. So not saying you would do this all the time, but actually let's say you know, you know you've, you've, you want to try and keep a balance and then during a session all of a sudden you notice that one sort of part of your either you know your threshold or your your so your anaerobic or your aerobic yeah. loads are growing up too fast you might in the moment dial that session back yeah because it's going to put you over a limit if you're really dialing into that kind of stuff yeah. seeing it real time is a positive i think yeah if you really dive in, if you get if you get if you know those numbers even i don't really like if you really dive into those numbers and really learn them you could definitely use that yeah what you can do is take yourself a nice little HRV test to kind of yep. using the ECG on the bezel yep. uh, and that'll give you an immediate snapshot of your kind of HRV system, right? Yeah, and it's not, I think it's important to say that this isn't kind of medical not approved yet, yeah. yet, but apparently it, it, that's, a work, that's a work in progress. The test is really easy to do. 
you just hold the thing for, for one minute, it takes you through and you can almost feel the pulsing as it's going so you know that it's working. And then you'll get a benchmarking score out of 100 okay. and that's broken down into different categories so you can see what your overall kind of strain is or your response to the strain that you've put your body under. That's you know, your HRV response, the physiological response yeah. to your training strain. It will kind of give you a little bit of a guidance message. Yeah. It's not going to recommend whether or not you go train again Okay. It's telling you about how you're recovering. Okay. So it's not mm-hmm. making any of that. It's not giving you a like, okay, take a day off. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's also very separate from the actual recovery feedback yeah, that you get. It doesn't yeah. mesh together. But I think it's very useful. One thing, one tip here, if you're going to do HRV, you want to be doing it at the same time, first thing in the morning under the same conditions, before you've had a coffee, before you've done anything crazy in the morning, to get the right readings and to do it consistently. And it doesn't give you an alert, like the polar will, on the Vantage V2, okay. it tells you now's the time to take your orthostatic test. And I and I wish it did, just to give you that little nudge because it's something you can easily forget. Uh, and I found myself actually setting an alert on my phone, okay. which makes sense to just do it on the watch. So I wish it would do that. But Yeah, I think for me, it needs to be a bit more integrated. I, like Kieran, I love that stuff. He uses it a lot. And I think you are someone who would get the most out of this feature. I, for me, it almost needs to be integrated into things, stats that I see already, and then it might trigger something in me. But I do think it's a nice addition. Again, it will get approved. I think. And then maybe just a quick final note on heart rate accuracy in general. I only did a couple of runs of this without a chest strap and it was pretty good, but I'm going to say, as I always do, get a chest strap. If you're spending 600 pounds on watch, you want a chest strap, right? Yeah, I mean, we've done enough of these now that, you know, there's just some familiar things that happen on the optical. It had a bit of lag, it had a bit of a lurch. Some of my, on the tests that I did, come back to my max heart rate in those runs would be slightly higher than a chest strap. That was also true pretty much of the Garmin Enduro's optical. Yeah get a chest strap to make all those Evo Lab stats better. Definitely, I'll definitely say it with a heavy watch as well. Like the best heart readings I've ever had are from lightweight watches like the Apple Watch, 4.245 that sit very close and snug. Big heavy watch, it's gonna move around, it's gonna, it's gonna mess up your systems. Moving on to the verdict then. So obviously we've actually brought up quite a lot of negatives to this watch, but I'm gonna say I don't overall have a negative impression of this watch. <laughs> I will say that. I think it's a lot better value than the Vertix One. It is really trying to give you these top end features and it's trying to do stuff that other watches haven't with GPS. I would say at the moment, this is a watch for the future in a way. I think there's a lot of stuff here that can be improved and will be improved most likely, but at the moment it's not really doing stuff better than other watches and a lot of its key features are slightly worse than when you're getting on the Phoenix 6 Pro. I think that's what's gonna be one of its problems is its headline features actually yeah. don't necessarily tell you all you need to know about this watch. They're actually not the best bits of it. Yeah. That one thing by it, that battery life, it's killer. Yeah. Like that is worth <laughs> that is in itself is a is a sell, selling point for this watch for me. Yeah. That's a luxury worth having and worth paying for. Yeah. One thing I do wish, Nick, is that I think if this watch were a little bit cheaper, I mean we probably said that about all watches. <laughs> yeah, we're very tight. <laughs> but what but what Chorus are really good at is coming in just, you know, adding all those feature sets at a point of value that's just below the competitors. Yeah. And I think they've made themselves a little bit of a problem here where they're coming in around the same, they're yeah. kind of around the same price as some very, very good watches that have got very well established kind of feature sets. And if this were a hundred pound cheaper, yeah, my recommendation for this would be much, much higher than it is right yeah. now. It doesn't fare as well against, for me, an Enduro or a Phoenix 6 because of the price tag. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, I guess what you can say is you're getting the Phoenix is obviously reduced a lot of time. But it's the same price as the Phoenix broadly. Actually, it's cheaper because the Phoenix with a sapphire screen is more expensive than this. But Phoenix will produce, but what the Phoenix does is all these features a little bit better, except battery life. Um, and also the Enduro is much more expensive. It has the battery life. But basically, Garmin has had all these features for a while, and all these teething problems you see here, they've been ironed out. Yeah. And um, that's not really Chorus's fault in a way. Like, it takes a while to iron it. Garmin had those problems. I had watches crashing with music on them when I was using Garmin, but they've done it now. So at this point, Chorus is catching up to a watch that already exists for a less price, for a lower price. I think some of the stuff that makes it expensive is stuff that we necessarily don't appreciate. The really rugged build for adventuring yeah. and stuff like that is not something that I'm ever going to use as a runner really yeah. so much. And even an adventurous ultra running like yourself, it is more for climbing and stuff like that in a way. Yeah. So that is a quite a key selling point that I guess we're not really appreciating, but it does end up with a price that you just go, okay, your Garmin Phoenix does all these things, it does them a bit better. So, and that, unless for me, the GPS needs to be the killer thing. Yeah. And I think because the GPS Phoenix can be a bit fiddly and fussy and that would have been a thing that really, and if you just want the battery life, the Enduro's there and it's doing a lot of the other stuff quite well. I might go to this Enduro because Enduro's a fair bit more, but the Enduro does do a lot of this stuff very slickly. Yeah, and it's just, a, I, I find overall the Enduro's are just a bit more neat, a bit more contact, compact, a bit more comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if the price again in the Enduro came down a bit, I think that at the time, if and when that might happen, 
this would be a very interesting watch for a lot of people. Yeah. The final thing I wanted to say, though, in favour of the Vertex 2 yeah. and in favour of what Chorus has done, Evo Lab, although I think it's got maybe a bit too many stats in there, it finally, I think, brings Chorus's watches in terms of that overall training load kind of performance insights. It brings it up to a level, and that's an, like, an important move on from them. And, yeah, I think, again, this is a watch that probably has some way to grow. And that's a great yeah. thing that Chorus always do, right? They're, yeah. They tend to roll features down and they'll continue to improve. So it'll be interesting to watch. Definitely. It's, it's, this is a watch that is essentially the complete package on paper. It's just when you use it, there's a few little things that crop up with each thing. Actually, all those things still work. You just have made it to work a little bit harder at things like dragging music across and stuff like that. But um, yeah, we expect everything to be refined a bit in the future. And, you know, the, it's there now, the baseline there. I guess the only thing to say is by the time they've caught all those up to Phoenix, what happens with the Phoenix 7? <laughs> yeah, where, did, where does that go? Yeah, yeah, always the way. That's it, guys. That's our review of the Chorus Vertex 2. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think of the watch. Is it something you're looking to invest in? Um, what else? You, what else? Like and subscribe. That's the main thing to do. <laughs> yeah, we should really start stopping at the front of the video. It's what everyone else does. <laughs> anyway, it's too late now. Um, yeah, like, subscribe, ring the little bell. Check, and Check out all the other videos we've got on all the other big kind of GPS sports watches out there. We've tested quite a lot of them, so we've done reviews on most of them. Uh, Have a look at that. And look at our best watches video. Got a big best watches video with a big long section about the really expensive ones, including the Vertex. So go have a look at that if you are looking to spend a lot of money on a very nice watch.